three-day kind of marathon story session at Jane Bay's house in the valley. Jay was, uh, Jane was George's assistant in those days. And, uh, and we broke the whole story in those three days, but George handed me in Hawaii a great deal of this movie. Uh, the MacGuffin, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, Indiana Jones' his entire character, the fact that he was kind of like a, uh, a little bit like Humphrey Bogart in The Treasure of Sierra Madre. He was rough around the edges, and he didn't do things in a completely noble and honorable way. He, did, he was a little bit of a mercenary in his search for hunt for antiquities. And, uh, but, you know, the, the actual, and the, the Nazis were involved, and Hitler wanted the, the Ark. He was looking for the spirit of destiny, but would settle for the Ark of the Covenant. And so George gave me enough of the concept that in Hawaii that day, literally 24 hours before Star Wars opened at the first 10 a.m. show, he pitched me the story, and um, I, I, I was just absolutely blown away by it. When you got the first script back, what was your original, when you read it, what was your original thought? Were there things that you wanted to change? How did that process happen? Well, every script's the same way. I mean, I mean, very few scripts come complete with a stamp of approval the second, you know, the writer hands it to the director. But I must say, there's only been a couple of movies in my experience that I've directed where the script was so close to being ready to shoot. One of those movies was E.T. the Extraterrestrial that Melissa Matheson had written the story of. Thank you. And that was as close to shooting as anything I've ever worked on before. And probably second to E.T. in terms of a script that was ready for prime time was Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's how close Larry had gotten to the original story. When you start the process of saying, okay, now we're gonna make the film, George Lucas is producing, you're directing, you guys are two of the biggest things in Hollywood at that time. Um, certainly still now, and what's the process to go to the studio and say, we want to make this? Uh, I, I didn't really get too involved in that. That was handled by George and his attorney and my, my agent. And all I know is I thought that, you know, there was a good chance nobody would make this movie because it was absolutely unlike anything that was being done in 1981. There was, there was no precedent for anything like this. And most of the studio heads in 1981 had never seen the Republic serials upon which we based most of the fun, cliffhanging, you know, set pieces. So I wasn't sure this was going to, and sure enough, the, the movie was turned down everywhere, partially because we were asking for an unprecedented deal that hadn't been given to anybody but Jimmy Stewart and Alfred Hitchcock and maybe a few other actors. We were asking basically to, to draw down profits before the studio broke even. And that had never really happened before to any of my generation. And so everybody in town said no. And the only person that stepped up to the plate was Michael Eisner at Paramount. And he went ahead and said, I'll do it. And, uh, and all of a sudden, we had a movie. You have your budget. How many days did you actually shoot for? Uh, I was scheduled to shoot the film in um, 87 days. And I came in at 73 days. And that's because wow. of the storyboard you did. There's a reason for that. I had made three movies before Raiders. And they had all gone stupidly over, over schedule, all of them. <laughs> Jaws scheduled for 55 days, won 158 days. <laughs> Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which premiered here, scheduled, scheduled for about 70 days, won 110 days. And then, and, then the, the, and then 1941, my third movie, scheduled for, I think, 75 days, won 179 days. <laughs> And, and I was so ready to be born again <laughs> in a responsible way. So in a sense, for me, Raiders was my chance to prove myself that I could responsibly direct a movie, not only on budget and on schedule, but ahead of budget and ahead of schedule. And that was, and I think that's why the film's tight. I really think the movie is tight because I didn't shoot a lot of coverage because I didn't give myself enough time to do all the angles that I had normally shot, at least on the last two movies, Close Encounters. And, 41, I got angles that you'll never see because three quarters of the coverage I didn't need, but I went and spent somebody else's money and shot coverage I wound up not needing. And I was convinced because George Lucas was and remains my best friend that I was not going to do this to George. Uh, I, would, I was not going to go be a profligate spender and spend all of Paramount's money and, and, and hurt George's reputation. So I decided to make the film 
with less money and less days. In order to do that, I had I storyboarded every single sequence. Every shot in this movie somewhere, in some archive, probably my archive, has a storyboard. Even dialogue scenes with Belloc and Indy sitting across from each other at a table. That was all storyboarded. And if I was running behind schedule, I would just go up to the big board and I would take down three or four pictures and I'd be back on schedule again. And that's exactly how the whole film was shot. You told a funny story about trying to sit down with Harrison Ford and go through the, that, that storyboard a couple times. And tell that story well, well what happened no no harrison was very used to me in the morning saying okay harrison here's what's here's the menu for today's schedule and i would open up my storyboard book and i would take harrison through the entire journey of that day maybe day 23 what we were going to shoot that day and harrison you know was really patient with me for the first couple. i think he was grateful that i cast him in the movie but after a couple of weeks of this and this is actually one of the documentary film guys shooting during the time we were making the movie, he actually caught Harrison as I'm explaining what the next shot's going to be, going like this, waving me off, getting up and walking out on me and leaving me alone in a, in a folding chair with my, all my storyboards on my lap. And that was the last time I ever went over any storyboards with Harrison. How, how long did it take before you realized he wasn't coming back? No, no, he would just, he, he, we'd get ready to do a setup instead of showing him the setup on a piece of paper. I would just tell him, walk through the door, sit in the chair, say your lines, and leave. That was, like that. One of the things that makes the film so amazing is the collaboration between you, George, and, of Harrison. course, Harrison. And um, you would also talk a lot about Harrison and what he brought to the role and how it changed that. So can we talk about your, your thoughts on that? Well, Harrison made monumental contributions to the movie. You know, his character was really well written by Larry. It was there on paper, but he fleshed it out. He brought everything to life. Harrison came up with lines. He would just show up on the set and he would say, I'd like to say when I'm looking at all the bruises on my body to Karen, it's not, it's, it, no, it's not the years, sweetheart, it's the mileage. Remember that line? I mean, that, that's a, that was Harrison's line. Um, Harrison came up with one-liners throughout the entire experience. And Harrison also was anxious to put himself in a vulnerable position where he would actually get hurt, where, I mean, not physically, backstage, but in the movie it would appear like he was really getting hurt, and Harrison kept wanting to get punished. Give me a cut here, I have to have a cut over here, uh, I want to get the crap beat out of me by this big German mechanic. I mean, Harrison was really into, he was anti-superhero, and even though the superhero craze had not even begun in 1981, Harrison, we had all read the comic books, and what Harrison did not want to be was a comic book hero. He wanted to be a guy who was vulnerable to the punishment of being dragged behind a truck and beaten up by a German mechanic under a flying wing. And, and, and so he volunteered himself to look really bad as he got worn to a frazzle as the story evolved. And that was something that a lot of actors in those days were just not doing. They were actually fighting against that, pushing back against that. And Harrison encouraged us do more bad stuff to him. <laughs> what were dailies like? I'm assuming that you watch them afterwards. Did you ever have to go back and reshoot or anything? Well, when I went to Tunisia, there were no dailies because we were in Tunisia. So we, so I shot there for four weeks and never saw anything. But I kept remembering a story I had heard about David Lean, that David Lean had shot a hundred straight, he shot like 230 days on Lawrence of Arabia. But for a hundred of those days, they couldn't get the dailies from England to Jordan. So for 100 days, he just depended on phone calls to the laboratory saying that the film was fine, it was looking good, he had people back in London who he depended on. And that story really gave me comfort that I would get on the phone and get lab reports, and the lab reports were good, and I had an editor back there that told me the compositions were good and the picture looked good, and so for four weeks, I didn't see a frame of film. I've never done that before, before or after. When the snake reflection when we watch it and we see the snake reflect was that tunisia no that was london that was at elstree studios was the set already taken down was it something you said we need to reshoot or did you not notice it at that time the reason i didn't notice it was uh <clears throat> and our one light prints that entire sequence with the cobra was printed down about two stops darker than it eventually became when we timed the movie we didn't discover the snake in the reflection until we went into the laboratory 
And I was looking at the answer print, and I suddenly saw the reflection of the snake, and I didn't understand it. And I suddenly realized that, oh my God, from there, but the more you put it down, the less you could see. And I thought because the shot wasn't going to last that long on the screen, nobody would ever see it. Everybody saw it. Every, everybody saw it. And, um, and I could have had a darker shot, and you would have never seen uh, the reflection, but I wanted the audience to see into the shadows a little more. And I'm assuming it's still in the new DC thing? Yes, you'll see it here too. Thank you for that. <laughs> I hope you'll see it here. Unless George got into it and didn't tell me. What would that all sound like? <laughs> Did you expect the reception that it would get when it no. opened? No, I didn't. No. Um, you know, when you get, if, for all of you that have done things and may, maybe made some films or done anything in the creative arts, you know that, that the worst thing you can possibly do is expect too much. And, 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 and I've always been afraid of expecting too much, which means if I receive a little, it's enough, often more than enough. So I've never had high expectations. And because this movie was a white elephant in the sense there was nothing quite like it in theaters. We shot it in 1980, it came out in 1981. I wasn't sure how it was going to be received. Uh, three days before the release of Raiders Lost Ark, George Lucas and I traditionally would always go to Hawaii and we would build these lucky sand castles for his movies or for my movies. <laughs> when he had a movie opening, like Star Wars, the first Star Wars episode four, I'd go to the Mauna Kea, we'd go to the beach, we'd build a sand castle, and if the tide didn't destroy the sand castle on the first high tide, the film would be a hit. But if the water came in and destroyed the hand castle, as it did with Howard the Duck, it wouldn't. <laughs> So, so um, the Sandcastle survived uh, episode four, and the grosses were huge, and the movie became a phenomenon and went into world history. And uh, the Sandcastle for Raiders of the Lost Ark also survived. But when the grosses came back, and Sid Gannis called us in a very disappointed vo voice and said, well, we were expecting a little more, but we did for our first weekend. We were in Hawaii. We didn't, you know, it's not like today where you can just check your phone what the grosses are. And he said, uh, you know, we did, I think it was 8.7 million for the first three days. Um, you know, that is not a lot today. That's considered sometimes a failure today if the film cost a lot of money. But then the, our film cost 20, which was a lot of money in 1981. Uh, like 2021, something like that. But um, we were disappointed in the gross. And I went back to work on, on, on Poltergeist, which was shooting, I was prepping E.T. At, at the same time I was working with Toby Hooper on Poltergeist. And I went back to the States and did that, or the States, meaning the other States. And, and uh, uh, not, not the island state, but... The, and I went back to work on that, and then I got a call from Frank Mancuso at Paramount, and he said, we had an amazing Monday, we did $1.4 million. I remember all these figures, because it was very important to me. And that was apparently was an amazing Monday based on the figure we did. The next weekend we knew it was going to be a hit because the next weekend it had fallen from 8.7 million to 8.3 million. And the hold was extraordinary. And we went on to do what we did. So we didn't, it was a delayed reaction. We weren't celebrating for about three weeks. Did you see it here in the dome? Because it, you know, it played in the dome. I saw it here when we, did, when we had the um, reissue at the dome. Did anybody see it here when it played in 1981 in the dome? I, I think I, I just, I watched it and it was just kind of funny because, you know, at the end of the day, if Indy was not there, all of those things would have still happened. <laughs> of course, without the heart of Indy, you wouldn't have had a movie. Right, right exactly. And look, the movie is a tremendous suspension of all of our disbelief, <laughs> and that's what great cinema is. Great <coughs> movies, great cinema, even average movies that tell a good story, a good yarn, and I think this is a good B picture that we've made here. I don't think it's an A picture. This is a real, legitimate, you know, B picture. and. Um, and it's, it's all about suspending your disbelief. Saying, if you, if you say that really logically in real life couldn't happen, and you're conscious enough in the middle of any movie to be able to say that, you're not really involved in the story. You're not really involved in the movie. So movies that test the audience, how much are they willing to buy? Uh, um, you know, I know in Indy 4,